And, um, good afternoon. I want to thank um, Jen Bloomquist um, and Suzanne Gukowski so much for including our gallery talk as part of um, this semester's Friday Forum. Um, first of all, I want to um, just say that I wish I wish we could all be in the gallery together um, this afternoon, but it looks like we're near 100 participants, so it's not quite yet safe for us to gather in this group, big group, but I do want to invite you to um, stop in Schmucker Art Gallery to see the faculty's incredible work. So the exhibition is open today, um, brand new, um, and it'll be up through March 4th. I'm going to then turn it over to the faculty very, very briefly. Um, uh, in just a minute so that they can speak about their work and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you all can um, can see this. Uh, so we are open Tuesday through Saturday 10 to 4, although we are not yet holding in person events. I want to thank uh, the people who have made this exhibition possible, first of all, the faculty, Mark, Tina, Austin, John, um, Henry, and Amanda, who have been so wonderful and easy to work with um, and for sharing their art with us. Um, I also want to thank Derek Rosenberry for installing the beautiful exhibition and making sure it opened on time, and also to Leslie Castile for all of her tireless work on just about everything for Schmucker Art Gallery and the art department. Um, a couple of quick announcements. We're hoping to have a closing reception, I think, on March 1st from 5 to 7, if everything um, kind of returns a little bit back to normal. Um, I also hope that we can keep our plan for to host another Friday forum in the gallery on February 11th, this time featuring our student curators uh, for the exhibition that's in our project space, Artwork, Labor, Identity, and Society. Um, first year students, there's a link in the chat box to an attendance sheet, a sign up sheet. Um, I'm gonna post that again once, um, once the faculty get going if you haven't seen the link yet. Um, um, and then I'm going to just share, before I turn it over to the faculty, I'm going to share just a few installation shots um, with you so we can all get situated and imagine ourselves in the gallery today. So this is sort of looking, walking through the doors and looking down, um, seeing Tina's work on the left, Amanda's work on the right, Mark's um, big, beautiful sculpture in the center, and uh, Austin's paintings along the wall. And then turning around the corner, um, John's installation of drawings, another work by Mark on this wall. Um, and then um, on the right, Henry Gepfer has a video and um, another one of Austin's paintings. And I wanna to mention too, um, Henry's not able to join us today, but I have a video link uh, for, of him speaking about his work that I'll share at the end of the talk. So now I'm gonna turn it over, I have two more installation shots of Mark's work, Tina's work, and Austin's paintings on the right. And now I'm gonna turn it over to, to Mark Work. So thank you all for being here and hope to see you in the gallery soon. Hello, um, uh, I'm hoping Shannon's gonna put up the slide of the uh, slide, uh, the image of the, uh, oh great. For those of you who don't know me, um, I was born in Liverpool, England, and I studied sculpture at Wolverhampton Polytechnic in England, and also the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in New York. I primarily work with steel and stone, but drawing is an important part of my working process. I draw every day. I'm exhibiting a few drawings in this show, one that you can see right here from a few years ago, and another more recent to show how I use drawing to think about sculpture. But the end for me is always sculpture. One of my favorite quotes comes from Ad Reinhardt, the painter. Sculpture is something you bump into when you back up to look at a painting. I also use, oh, I'm laughing inside right now. I also use cardboard in my working process when I'm thinking about sculpture. It's much less expensive material and it's also forgiven. Cardboard can give me a good idea of what my pieces will eventually look like in steel. I don't use a great deal of color in my work. For one thing, I'm colorblind, but I also concentrate much more on shape than I do on color. The one reoccurring color I use looks like rust, which actually is rust from a chemical patina. And I often cover it 
with linseed oil to slow down the process of change. Can you uh, change the slide? Thank you. The scale of my work varies considerably from small gallery pieces, which are sometimes maquettes for bigger pieces, or sometimes pieces in their own right. I make medium sized pieces, often for intimate spaces like courtyards, and I make larger monumental sculptures, which are located outside in public spaces, such as in Chicago, which is a wonderful city for sculpture, by the way. I participate in invitationals around the world where I make sculpture on site, sometimes with the public watching me. I really enjoy the challenge of having a limited amount of time to work on a piece. I also like to interact with the public as they ask questions about my process, my ideas, and even the tools. I have lived in the US now for almost 30 years, and I just became a US citizen in 2020. As an immigrant living in the US, I've long been interested in the notion of sense of place and the relationship between identity and place. I am constantly looking at landscapes, particularly urban landscapes, and how people interact with those spaces. I spend a lot of time traveling, and in the recent body of work, I'm looking at landscapes from above. Many people ask about figurative aspects in my pieces. I always consider the human figure in my work, and I'm also interested in architecture. So it's possible to see both or either in the pieces that I make. I enjoy hearing what people see in my work. In a show recently in Sag Harbor, New York, someone acquired a small piece because they were a jazz musician and they felt that the piece represented the dynamics of a jazz quartet. I had been thinking about a cityscape when I made the piece, but I can appreciate the closeness and the connection of a quartet, the relationship the musicians have to one another. Currently, I'm working in a foundry in New York State with bronze casting. It offers new challenges and I'm enjoying the new direction in the work. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too short. And I am going to, um, I think, jump ahead to um, Austin. So we'll come back to Tina. So just. Um, we have Austin next. Thank you, Shannon. And actually, you can just yeah put up the painting. Thank you. I'm Austin Sigemeyer, and um, I'm the assistant professor of painting here at the college. This is my fourth year teaching here. And I'm originally from Idaho. I grew up in a town called Rathrum, a small town in northern Idaho. And I studied in state colleges in Washington state. And then I taught out there for a number of years before relocating out east. When I'm not uh, painting, um, my other hobbies are I really enjoy rock climbing and the outdoors, and I play a bit of music as well, too. So um, I would say the overarching theme in my work is I'm interested in talking about some of the um, innate ironies of the human condition and um, really addressing the sort of tension between the individual and society at large. And so I view my work as a theater of these kind of invented narratives that address these types of human behaviors and really um, recently our relationships to the modern environment and particularly these kind of complex um, imagined landscapes. So, uh, oftentimes, as the narratives unfold, they are portraying these people that are fragmented um, in these spaces that are increasingly hard to navigate um, and to cope with, and in many cases, they're kind of these threatening environments. Um, in terms of the way that I make my work, I chiefly consider myself a painter first. But in order to kind of envision these spaces, I use a lot of drawing and lately exploring more digital tools and collage as a way to put these things together. And in the past, I've worked with everything from, you know, live models, having somebody come and sit at the studio for me to draw them, um, but also the incorporation of photography and a lot of found imagery that I get from journalistic sources, um, as well as web images. And 
um, in this series in particular, uh, so this image, Grave Digger, Atom Splitter, you can see it was painted in 2020. This is really a transition from the work I was doing before, which was uh, more beach scenes and this kind of bright blue sky um, sort of lighting quality. And this is actually the return from the shutdown kind of stay at home period. I'm coming back to the studio and wanting to really explore these scenes that take on a kind of a nocturnal mood and use this chiaroscuro lighting um, with the heavy kind of bright light and dark shadow. And as I mentioned, you know, some of my uh, source material is my own photography as well. So this image is um, from a landscape photograph that I took at Atomic City, Idaho, which is in southern Idaho and was apparently the first nuclear powered town um, in the United States of America. And the other thing that's uh, sort of a recurring theme in this series is the figures are mostly all attempting to kind of escape or to move through some type of portal or, um, you know, in this case, they're digging a grave. So Shannon, you could go to the next slide, please. This piece is titled Rub-A-Dub. And again, I'm looking at um, the human figure and the contemporary environment. And um, you can see in the background, this is actually one of the tents that was out on campus um, as a part of the you know, institution's idea to be able to cope with the effects of the pandemic. And so, um, again, I'm really thinking about the lighting, but also this um, idea that the figure is faceless and that they are, um, there's kind of a focus on the doorway of the tent, as well as that this figure is like passing through this donut form of the, uh, the inflatable. And you can go to the next slide, please. So this piece I modeled for, and in a way it's a self-portrait, but I titled it Subject 03693, Start the Dig. And um, in it, I'm again, you know, investigating this nighttime landscape, trying to speak to just, I guess, some of the anxiety of the unknown and thinking about this dark sort of space where figures are sort of in between these two realms. And so using the digging of the grave as a way to, I guess, talk about the part of the human condition, which is obviously life and death, um, but being stuck between these two spaces. Um, and with the title, I actually just took the number of the digital photographs that I had used to, you know, photograph myself as the, um, the name for myself, subject 03693, to sort of dehumanize the, um, subject and again, draw attention to this kind of tension between the individuality and the society. And you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, with this painting, I was really thinking about um, the increasing occurrence of forest fires out West and wanting to do something that would explore the, that kind of lighting quality, like the lighting quality of uh, what it might be like to experience um, being kind of in the heart of the forest fire. And so I titled it Red Threat, which is kind of a way to tie together formally the choice that almost everything in this image are in tones of red, yellow, or orange. Um, and then this is one of the images, you know, where my painting is really starting to change in its incorporation of collage. You can see some of the kind of hard edge and fractured um, planes that come together. Um, although it's an oil paint, but really referencing the kind of torn paper of the collage. And then I think what another thing that really inspired this painting was I had seen in the news about people that were trying to evacuate um, these forest fires in California. And um, this is sort of during the lockdown period as well. And how um, some citizens, some vigilante kind of citizens were going out and accosting people with rifles, stopping them as they're trying to evacuate 
and saying that they're, you know, trying to find Antifa who have set the forest fires. And to me, that was like super terrifying bit of news to get. So that's really the hunter in the bottom left corner is sort of to represent this, um, I guess, complex, you know, environment, but I'm wanting this painting to be able to be read in many different ways. The title Red Threat to me sort of speaks to America's history and our fear of communism, our deep-seated fear of communism or anything kind of socialist and that being equated with the um, color red. Uh, red being kind of a reference to the Republican Party and the ideologies that I was hearing in the news a lot. Um, also for hate and anger. And um, then again, I was probably thinking about some of the rise of this move towards fascism and dictatorship. Um, so yeah, that's everything I have to say about my work. Thank you, Shannon. I'm gonna jump back to Tina now. Yeah, Tina. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, so there, um, for my work, there's lots of possibilities of um, how to talk about it um, and jumping back and forth between them can sometimes be a little bit much. Um, and so if we could go back to that first image. There we go, Ooh, there we go. Um, and so starting with this piece, um, I'm going to first delve in into the the idea of the teapot. Um, I'm a wheel throwing functional potter um, at heart. Um, that's my prime directive. And um, the teapot is really the epitome of that functional format. Um, and the thing that I really love about the teapot is its complexity, that um, it has all these different parts, the main body of the pot, um, the lid, the knob, the spout, the handle. And these parts of the pot come um, to the pot in a sequence um, that one starts with the body of the pot, resolves the idea uh, and the form of the lid, um, and then the knob comes, and then the spout comes, and then the handle comes. And so in that sequence, um, I'm solving design problems and kind of visual balance and interest problems along the way that the, the body determines decisions that I make about the lid and the rids, lid solution determines decisions that I make about the knob in relationship to the body. Um, with the spout comes trying to pull all of those things together um, in a cohesive whole and then the handle is the epitome of that solution. Um, decisions about the handle have to take into account what's happened in all these last steps um, and pull them more fully together. Um, any things that have kind of cropped up along the way of deciding, making these sequential decisions um, for those prior parts, it's the handle's job to solve all of it. And so um, there's something about the, the way, the complexity of all of these decisions coming together that's a particular and special challenge. Um, and that the idea of a teapot in the functional format um, is the kind of tour de force of that kind of problem solving. Um, looking at the the, the body of this particular pot to go a slightly into the techniques, um, this form is thrown on the wheel and is completely symmetrical um, at the beginning. Um, and those dots are pressed into, um, with a tool pressed into the wall of the soft clay. And so it deforms the whole outside. It's like pushing your finger into an inflated balloon. And, and so with that, that surface undulates um, with all of those dots. And in this form, I then go back, went back into the surface and actually carved into those undulations with the carving tool kind of surfing over the waves of that form. 
And so that slight undulation line that's happening on that surface is from that tool surfing the waves. Um, this is a, a, usually a technical problem that intro students fear. Um, it's a, a, a trimming challenge um, that usually rocks their world and causes all sorts of problems. Um, but using that surfing um, as an aesthetic kind of result um, is a special walking the line between technical proficiency and skirting with ceramic disaster. Um, and so there's something about, something special about this piece um, in using those two things together in the midst of all of these other parts um, coming to a design solution. Next slide, please. And so with my challenges with um, early onset Parkinson's, um, I typically was using very stiff clay to do some of these alterations on the wheel thrown forms. Um, because the stiffer the clay, the more tolerant it is, the stronger it is um, for dealing with those pushes into the surface um, and the pot still standing up. Um, but with my particular challenges, I found that I really needed and benefited from going to much softer clay. Um, I could um, do what I needed to do except on, on the wheel, except um, it wasn't going to be as tolerant of these vigorous alterations. Um, and I, I wanted the, the simplified challenge of making small um, for a certain kind of ease and trying to pack all of the form considerations that happen in a more complex teapot into the tiny and often overlooked form of format of a bud vase. It's usually a, a, a simple and discreet, um, quiet little thing that's there to just hold up a single flower. It has a very small job. Um, and trying to get all of these visual complexities of the teapot into that smaller format was a special challenge. And we can also see in this, in this piece, um, a lighter touch with that alteration um, and the pushing in of the form so that it's simultaneously one profile in that indent and another profile in the, to coin a, phrase, coin a term, the outdent simultaneously um, <clears throat> that its smallness um, becomes a certain kind of fortitude to balance out the teapot. If we can go to the next slide, please. And so here I'm stripping down um, some of those more dramatic things happening in the surface of the pot and just sticking with um, the visual solutions of those forms um, while still wanting in my soul to alter the clay, um, I've kind of diminished that alteration to just these little pushes um, up around the collar of the lid. And so thinking about how can those alterations become really minimal while still carrying a certain kind of importance um, in the piece. And here, this form has a certain kind of heaviness in the body that's balanced out by the pulling up um, direction of the lid into the knob. So there's a certain pull up with that knob and a certain push up with the collar around, and then the extensions of the handle and the spout um, to continue a little bit of that lift. Next slide, please. And here I'm stripping back to the ultimate simplicity of form. Um, in the plate form, this is a large platter um, and retaining a certain surface manipulation um, to put all the focus on that surface manipulation. This is rope impressed, um, a very traditional historic kind of surface uh, manipulation in multiple cultures all around the world um, in ceramics. And so it's a certain historical riff at the same time. 
um, in, in a plate or a platter, the demands of the form are so simple in that format. It's really a surface and a rim. And in this case, we're seeing it presents it on the wall. So we're not even dealing with the underside. It starts to present as a painting. And so it's a, this format is a different kind of tour de force in functional ceramics. It's the place where the potter makes the piece in order for that piece to be dealt with as if it were a painting on the wall. It's a different kind of um, interaction with the viewer. Next slide, please. And so going back into the common simple mug um, in its daily kind of simplicity of form. Um, and I'm choosing to talk about this one a little, this grouping um, a little bit here, because in a sense, I, I think about um, a pot as being all pots at the same time. And so when I'm dealing with the mug and working through these form considerations, um, each of these mugs is at its core, the mug before it and different versions and variations um, of some of the form components take a certain step forward in the next iteration of that mug. And so here we can see a, a kind of grouping where different parts of those mugs um, change up as we go to the next one that the, the first one with its indent, that indent then becomes an outdent in the next, um, indents and outdents um, in certain parts of the third form, et cetera. And so you can see the permutations of how, how the handle has to change along the way in order to accommodate the new versions um, of this archetypal mug. And next one, please. And here, this one's a bit of a transition piece um, because in this uh, piece, using the soft clay and going for that vigorous altering means the wall is going to distort more dramatically. Um, those pokes um, into the surface of the clay um, are happening when that clay is quite wiggly. Um, and so those pokes go rather deep and um, the kind of, undulating line at the middle and near the base is in part me going back in to do a, a technique on top of those alterations, essentially re-throwing this wiggling wall that I've just um, poked the Dickens out of, um, which has made it even more wiggly. And so it's starting to torque just a little bit with the spinning of that wheel and stopping just at the right time um, so that it doesn't twist itself up. There's just the um, slight suggestion of that twist starting to happen. And working with uh, um, the nature of that soft clay in this poked and destructured state um, and using those wiggle lines as a visual aesthetic, um, allowing them to be there and then working through the handle um, in order to solve some of those things, one of my guiding principles is the handle coming out of a certain feature line um, in the form. And here, the kind of accidental twisting of this sets that feature line almost right in the middle of the pot, which is a very awkward place um, for solving the handle. And so I originally um, tried this one with the handle that stuck way out to the right and decided I didn't like it, cut a chunk out of it to make it smaller, um, kept that chunk and allowed that little reattachment to be a line on the handle there down at the bottom. And so leaving evidence of that uh, re-solution of the handle and then noticing that the top part of the handle was doing something I really don't like, which, had a, which was having a, a big kind of square gap that seemed very out of place in the design of this cup. And so the solution needed to be putting a thumb rest, um, which generally I don't like in a mug at all. It's usually a, I consider it a, 
um, a weak solution for a not very good handle. Um, and here, allowing that to become a, a reinvention. How can I how can I work with that nub in order to make that space up at the top make more sense? Using a piece of the handle itself, which officially has a cross section that's the size of the indents, the pokes on the cup. And suddenly all these things made sense. Um, and that handle and that lowly little thumb nub um, allowed these pokes um, to be pulled together. And officially this has what we call glaze flaw that the glaze when I was dipping it into the bucket, couldn't flow into those indents. They were too deep um, for the surface tension viscosity of the glaze. And normally I would take this pot out of the glaze bucket, look at it and say, well, that's a problem. And diligently take a little brush and get some glaze in there, floating it down a little wire so that it would actually fill the space and not trap air underneath. But this flaw happened so consistently across the front of this mug. And it highlighted the indents, these pokes, um, so beautifully. And it seemed to be with the nature of this whole mug and all the funky little solutions that I was solving along the way. And I allowed it to stay the way it came out of that bucket. And so this is a really interesting transition piece for me um, of using all of those supreme design resolution strengths and doing it with a piece that has things that I might consider problematic issues, a twist, a poke that is much too deep, a wall that's starting to be undermined, a thumb nub that I've solved in order to make something else work. And so this may be a place um, that I continue to play in. And normally experimental work I might not show, but um, this one I thought was important too. Now, I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit long. Please forgive me. Um, that was great. So I'm going to move ahead to, um, so thank you to John next. Okay, go ahead, John. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I, uh, I come from a graphic design background, or at least that's what my training is, but I've always been a cartoonist. Um, and, in, and as well as kind of working in sort of a commercial realm, um, I've been teaching various kind of cartooning and sequential art for about 30 years. Um, I've been teaching here um, at Gettysburg for 15, um, where presently I teach drawing and graphic novels to film, which indeed is comics adapted to movies. Um, so uh, unlike, you know, uh, you know, most of the work you see in a gallery, my work is primarily, or its purpose is commercial, its endpoint. Um, I've been doing a comic strip called Daddy Days, uh, spelled D-A-Z-E, for about four years. It's in about, uh, it's a syndicated comic strip. It's in about 80 newspapers. It's on the internet and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it is a daily comic strip. So I need to do one, you know, I need to do, I need to have one comic strip done for every day. At this point, it's about 1,300 comic strips, um, which you know, seems like a lot, and it is a lot. Uh, although I have a lot of colleagues, friends who are my age who have been syndicated for decades and have done a lot more. So if I was to tell them that number, they would they would thumb their noses at me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts, and then I'm going to talk about meaning. Um, so I did another strip, um, a comic strip called Bonanas in the in the aughts for about four years as well. And uh, you know, going back that whopping decade and some change, uh, things had changed a lot. Um, the internet became more important. Um, all daily comic strips as well as Sunday comic strips needed to be done in color. And I knew the amount of work that was going to come up 
when I was doing this new strip. So I decided I needed to streamline the process to make it more efficient. Um, to that end, um, I started working, you know, going from basically Bristol board, which is a, you know, pretty nice paper to going on to drawing on plain old um, uh, copier paper when you get right down to it, because I needed to scan these. Um, I needed to scan them on a, you know, regular old standard um, uh, scanner and then be able to drop this art into the panels that I already have made in, um, in Photoshop. Um, I do keep this to four panels. I keep my Sunday strips to six panels, specifically so they can be stacked when you're reading it on the internet or also that the newspapers can stack them in different ways. So it's a little bit different. I used to you know, go between one to four panels with my other comic strip. Also, you know, I do draw on paper. I like drawing on paper. I've tried and probably will try some more drawing on computer specifically, but I really like to draw on paper. I like being in a physical space as opposed to a fake physical space. Um, I like to be able to turn my paper a lot because I'm very much about sort of moving my hand in certain directions. I, I tell my students a lot about that. It's like, okay, turn your paper, make it as easy, follow the follow the arc of your hand. Um, the, um, as you can see here, this kind of, uh, and this is not one of the strips is up. This is actually, I finished this yesterday just so I could uh, take photos of the stages of it. But I, I basically, you know, will will write a gag. You know, if you look at my face, it's just like write it right on a piece of scrap paper, and then I put in all the the words. Um, I I do some basic blocking out in what is non photo blue, so it won't. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of erasing, but so it won't show up, and it gives me kind of a sense to start. Then I do all the penciling, and then I do the inking, and. Part of my thing when I was doing my other comic strip is I really needed to change my process to make it more interesting for me. Um, I, I'm not a, a, a person who is able to really spend a lot of time with the drawing. Um, I tend to want to go a little bit quicker than most. Um, I, I do abstract expressionist painting, which is very much that. And so it, it certainly lends itself with that. And then so to speed this up, I actually started working with you know whatever I had, and part of that was these cheap markers I had from Staples that I started inking with, which really didn't you know after about a year I was like this is a mess you know they were too bloody in places they it, it was just too hard, and I ended up making a transition. Uh, I used to work with a brush that I would dip in ink and then draw, and I really liked that line. I liked the line quality. I liked the line variation. And I had a friend of mine who'd sent me a bunch of uh, Japanese um, brush markers. So not don't have to dip them, you can just draw with them. And that's what I've been using uh, for the last three plus years. Um, this, so on the very right hand side, you know, that is, uh, that is the finished state of the art. And that's what I have up in the gallery. The, um, it is, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, it is not, it is, it is not very finished thing. It is not the finished product that you see, you know, I don't have the panels and it's an in-between stage, but it shows practice. It shows, it shows my artistic practice, shows my process. Um, and so, and it shows the effort, you know, if you look close, you can see where I goof up. You can see where, um, I've, you know, redrawn hands off to the side to paste them in. Cause I don't like how it looks. To make this a little bit more interesting to look at as well, um, I made it a little bit of an installation and put up, uh, I think it's 80 strips to kind of represent the amount of work that needs to be done for this. It is an unending schedule. I call it feeding the monster. Um, and that monster is never full. Um, so let, let me talk very briefly about the meaning behind this. And it's true, I've done a lot of different work where there maybe isn't as much direct meaning behind it, you know, and, and you know, I'm a cartoonist, so it's just like, you're just doing funny stuff. 
this actually has a, a real personal connection. This is a fictionalized version of, uh, of myself and my son, who is now 11, but him is a baby. And it came from um, a comic strip I did when I was doing my MFA, when he was first born. And it was sort of, I did, you know, it was kind of documenting. I did it weekly. I just put it up on, on uh, uh, some site. Don't even remember what it was. Um, just to document that stuff for me. And they were true stories that were funny. You know, that's how I did it. When I started thinking about fictionalizing it, I, I, I tweaked it some. I, one of the things that came up in my head was that my son, when he was about six months old, started saying the word ba over and over again. And kids make lots of sounds all the time, but he actually thought he was talking. So he would be like, ba, 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 you know, and he really thought. And so what I did is I took that into the strip and the, the baby in the strip talks in these ba's. The dad interprets out to the reader. Um, I have it in the strip that only his family, only the family can understand the baby. Um, um, I have uh, also, you know, I've, I've all, both thought and have co had comments from people on the internet that this may just be um, a father who is slowly going insane, but the, the kid is not saying anything. The, the father is crazy. Um, the, the baby is also smarter than any other baby. You know, he, he does lots of things. He's, you know, reading books. He shouldn't be able to read at all. Um, I have surreal things that happen. Uh, you know, the thing about a baby being smarter is just, you know, I can have a little bit of fun with it. But a lot of times for people who have kids, you, you can realize how much smartness your kids have, smartness, you know, intelligence. There's a lot of surreal things that happen that usually happen off panel, which, yeah, it, it can be a little bit certainly fun. And it's fun to have a, you know, a, a, the thought of a kid doing this. But that in some ways represents the crazy stuff that kids do or kids get into that you don't you know, you don't have a concept of um, there, you know, I work in things like parental worry. Um, sometimes I actually have a series going on right now that's like all about just a, a parent who is just beaten down. Um, the, the whole thing kind of acts as a conversation, sort of, you know, a, parenting as conversation between your kid that lasts their whole life, hopefully, with that, you know, few years when they hate you as a teen. I haven't gotten that yet, but uh, it's coming. Um, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, it, this, this does very much so seem like me and my kid. My kid's 11. And I, one thing I have in there is there's a lot of affection. There's a lot of hugs. There's a lot of kisses. Um, that still goes on now with my kid. That should end any minute now. Um, I'm expecting 45 minutes tops. It'll be over. Um, so in a lot of ways, this is sort of a fictionalized, it's certainly a fictionalized version, but it is, it has kind of tones of reality in it. So anyway, thank you. Great. Thank you. And then we have Amanda. So Amanda, I'll just um, switch when, um, as you're talking. Okay. I'm going to talk for a little bit up front and then hopefully I included many photos in this so we'll go through them pretty fast. Um, before I talk about the project that I'm sharing, I just want to introduce myself. This is my first year adjuncting here at Gettysburg. I'm teaching video production and digital media. And I really appreciate being included in this show. It's so cool to hear about everybody else's work and I can't wait to see it up in the gallery. Um, my background is primarily in documentary arts. I've spent many years now doing a variety of different things with that basic entry point, everything from working as a community journalist to being in the digital strategy side of a strategic communications office. And all throughout the way, as I'll kind of explain about my process in this project, my entry point is always experience and always people, being in community with people. So this project, for instance, is um, a document that 
started as a pretty straightforward still photography um, project about a women's tackle football team in Durham, North Carolina, as they like embarked on their season. And what I'm sharing is uh, black and white photos that are newsprint posters and are one facet of a much bigger sort of body of work that spans experimental film and installation. And basically from the entry point of documenting their season became many, many uh, things. So you can go to the next slide. So to, to kick off, like, how do you even pick a project when you're a documentarian? Where do you begin? You're usually, it's just a feeling of curiosity and some Googling. And in this place, I was really, um, I'm really interested and, you know, motivated by this like search for female power and togetherness and, you know, questioning like how are our identities formed, you know, through our daily lives. And so I had this idea that maybe women's football existed, but didn't know and did a little bit of research and found out that not only does it exist today in the town that I was living, but women's tackle football has existed since the 1930s when women started barnstorming, just playing uh, casual pickup games. And it developed into a whole system of semi-professional teams. And this, if you get into the history of women's tackle football is a photo of the Toledo Troopers who are the most famous team. Um, Linda Jefferson was the like voted women's athlete of the year in 1973. And she's sitting in the middle here of this team photo of them together in the seventies. So you can go to the next slide, Shannon. When I found that out, it really gave me like a deeper connection and purpose to the project. I already was invested in the idea, but I showed up at a preseason practice of the local team in Durham and just felt an instant connection to the team and to the story. And without knowing where it would go, spent the next six months traveling around with them and getting to know them as best I can as people on and off the field and starting to explore why women's football is playing such a important role in their lives at the moment and why I as a woman myself documenting felt so empowered by the environment. You know, I think this picture is emblematic of the fact that we don't see a lot of photos of women women's sports. It's just underrepresented and is, you know, is emblematic of a much bigger, larger social issue of women's stories being underrepresented and not seeing them in, you know, in empowered and aggressive spaces as often. So this team sort of transgressing that historically entrenched model made me feel as a woman, like I too could explore things in my life that maybe I was afraid of trying or didn't feel like was expected of me. So, there's many, many anecdotes and things that I could say about every photo, but two things I wanna leave you with is, um, I decided to print these on newsprint and black and white because I wanted to try and make the photos feel somewhat timeless and not like they were unusual because it was a women's team, just like it would be any, any sports team having what turned out to be a championship season, winning their, essentially their Super Bowl at the end of the season, which was, you know, very lucky on my end after spending all those months documenting um, and seeing like how that material itself would age. So the photos that are in the gallery are like not treated. They were printed in a old school printing press at a small newspaper in North Carolina that let me borrow their equipment and worked with me to print them. And they were mass produced. And they've yellowed and they've changed a little bit. And for me now showing them here, it feels like sharing not just my artwork, but like a personal um, piece of ephemera of history that many people often don't get the chance to see and don't get the chance to learn about. So this last photo, I think the next one is um, on the field after winning the championship game in Texas and just like the pure bliss and excitement that 
you know, some of the women on the team had played many, many seasons and were in their late forties and maybe risked serious injury playing tackle football, but felt so uh, empowered and like themselves on the field that to be, to be the champions at the end of all that was really, really beautiful. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. So if y'all just have um, five more minutes or so, um, Henry uh, couldn't be here today, but they uh, shared with me this video. Um, and so I hope this will play. Hi there, folks. Can everyone hear you? that? Hey, thumbs I'm up grateful if you can hear to be it. sharing some virtual space with you, even if I can't be there in a live capacity. My name is Henry Gepfer. I teach printmaking at Gettysburg College. Um, and in the gallery, you'll see I've got three prints and a video for you to check it out. Uh, despite the fact that I teach print and I'm trained as a printer, uh, I'm equally fascinated by photography, video, and performance. Um, I'm really interested in print, photo, and video, particularly because they constitute a linear trajectory of forms of graphic communication meaning all information that you're gonna consume on a daily basis is gonna either come to you in the form of print, uh, through photo or through video. And this really begins when print uh, is deemed a viable form of democratic uh, distributed material. Um, and it's accelerated uh, once we hit like peak capitalism in the 20th century. Um, I love how these things kind of intersect with the situation, this international idea of uh, spectacle, uh, and this idea that all of this stuff that's being broadcast to you has a particular agenda. There is skin in the game for all of them. Um, but the way that that kind of worms its way into my work is a little bit more abstract. I think uh, to kind of illustrate the way I think of my practice, I borrow a quote from David Lynch, which is, look at the donut, not the whole. Um, I like looking at these processes, not necessarily just the ideas that are being communicated through them or channeled through them. I like to look at the actual processes themselves and think about, uh, in some ways, the politics of working with the apparatus that produce them. Um, so for example, thinking about the video that's in the gallery right now for Death Dream. Um, I like thinking about photography and how it can be celebratory, but it can also be relatively morbid. Photo has this whole uh, set of baggage related to death that's kind of built in, uh, whether we're talking about spirit photography on one hand, or considering Rosalind Krauss's uh, conception of the trace in her studies of Nadar. Um, the groundwork of this piece came to me in the early part of uh, the pandemic lockdown. Uh, when we couldn't go anywhere, my wife and I would take our lunch breaks and go for walks in our neighborhood. Uh, we'd walk through this one cemetery because we knew that nobody else was going to be there. And as we were walking through this cemetery in April of 2020, we were thinking about how we spent May of 2019 uh, walking through cemeteries in Paris. We were, you know, on vacation, traipsing through Père Lachaise and the one in Montparnasse that I can't remember the name of right now. Um, but somewhere along the way, the ad, it crossed my mind as being particularly funny to think of um, a funny and fitting uh, to potentially use a photo booth as a makeshift mausoleum. Uh, because then in this very sad environment, also got this like, really funny and joyous thing where maybe people get a little bit raucous inside of it. Um, so I made a short video about that idea. Um, and at the time, uh, it gave me something to do other than be depressed outside of Zoom meetings. Um, but I think this kind of approach is pretty prevalent in the prints that I've got in the space. Although the prints are often, often feel a little bit more like studies for larger works that might take the form of a a performance or a video or something sculptural. Um, I kind of think about structuring my prints almost like jokes. Um, they can have a one line feel to them, um, but there's almost always a punchline. So if you look at 
piece like broadside one, which is the blue and pink and purple piece uh, that has words spelled backwards. I was zooming out and thinking about the very basic nature of making a relief print using text. And if you don't reverse your text, uh, it's going to print backwards. But to do that intentionally can bring you around something conceptually fun. Um, the color scheme I chose based on the bisexual flag and my sexual orientation and how I can never really bring myself to appropriately enunciate or uh, articulate the things that I identify with. Um, there are two Riso pieces in the gallery, I believe. Um, the one that I'd like to focus in on in the last piece I'll talk about is called a relic. Um, it's made through the Riso uh, process, but there are two uh, glossy hand prints that feel really good to touch. Um, in the studio that I print for, we have this process called thermography. And thermography is, if you've ever handled a soft cover book that has like a raised glossy text, that's what thermography is. Um, so as we were making books in the studio one day, I was thinking about how fun it would be to make hand prints. And then reflecting back on the pandemic and how I used to touch things with reckless abandon, like in the grocery store, in a parking lot, uh, you know, all sorts of random stuff. And now every time I'm out in public, I have to sanitize until my hands are so dry. Um, and it's really just an homage. To One minute. It's a print that looks nice that maybe you'd want to touch, but I don't know if you would feel safe doing that. Anyway, I've probably gone every time at this point. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to hear me uh, talk about my work. And if you have questions about any of my work, you can feel free to stop by my studio on Monday to Monday. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna end it, the PowerPoint there now. I'm not too sure if we can go over by just a minute or two if y'all have any questions for the artists. But I just want to say thank you, thank you for being here, and thank you for um, all the artists to participate.